Now it's time for our first panel, the Sports Graphics Masterclass. Uh, with me today, we have Nikki Whittle, who is the Global Graphics Operations Manager at The Zone, where she oversees the live graphics and data solutions across the entire business. We have Pedro Sagasti. He's a soft, uh, senior software developer at Sky Sports in Germany, where he's responsible for data-driven and AR graphics. And last, but by no means least, Harold Hovdevik, who is the head of graphics at TV2 Norway. He oversees a team of designers and developers producing graphics for four sports channels. Welcome to you all. Uh, before we start, don't forget, if you have questions for our panel, please put them in the Zoom chat or use the Q&A tool and we will ask the best ones live on air. We're going to start with a couple of real graphics fundamentals. Um, Harold. I'll come to you first, if that's okay. What is the main goal of using a graphic or graphics during a live sports broadcast? Hi, thank you. Uh, the goal is to enhance the viewer experience and make the production attractive and informative to watch. Graphics is used to gain and keep the viewer's attention, make it interesting to watch. So the graphics can be decor, informative, used for analysis and used for interaction with the viewer. And a major goal for us that we have worked a lot on during 2020 has been viewer interaction and engagement. So we have integrated our sports app with the on-air graphics. So the viewers are presented a question in the app by the presenter using the on-air graphics. And the answers are registered in the sports app and then integrated back into the live sportcast with using the sidebar. So this way we can use our graphics to promote our sports app and vice versa. Thank you very much. Nikki, let's bring you in now, if uh, if you don't mind. What makes for an effective sports graphic? Um, I think as a lot of the points that Harold just touched on is it is enhancing that um, experience for the viewer and engaging the information that is coming from the data. Um, the graphics shouldn't really distract from the action, but enhance that experience. Um, so if you think of the head to head graphics or key player stats that we use, that can help support the narrative of the match. So it doesn't take away from the action that's happening. Um, and I think especially right now with the empty stadiums where we're missing out on the atmosphere, the data and graphics can really complement the commentary to build that back up. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Pedro, uh, what are your main considerations when it comes to sports graphics? So we try to put the viewer always on the center. So we are always thinking that you know, we have a really big amount of viewers seeing the games. Some people are watching the games maybe on LED TV 60K. Some people are maybe on a train watching the game on a device. So graphics should also contemplate these situations that everybody can see the graphic clearly, even if, for example, there is no audio that you understand what's going on in the game. So I think that graphics should add value. And also, we also collect a lot of data that is going on the game. So finding a way of the right visual representation of that data has always been a challenge for us as well. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Nikki, DAZN has the rights to a variety of different sports, obviously depending on territory, but uh, does the way you use graphics differ from sport to sport? And if so, how and why? Um, yep, you're right. At DAZN, we're always signing new rights and acquisitions for a number of sports. Um, so obviously for us, different sports have different requirements. So what may be relevant for one sport might not be relevant for another. Um, I think a perfect example is if you think about football, it's essential to have the score on screen at all times, but in a sport like boxing, it's more important to highlight the rounds, the time, and something to allow the viewer to identify the fighter, such as the trunk colour. Um, we also look at what data is available and where that can be used to enhance the viewer experience. Um, and again, to use those two sports I just mentioned, for football, we would use things like heat maps, but for boxing, we would use punch stats. So really, it's about how we work with those production teams to make sure we've gathered those requirements and plan out how they want to use the graphics. 
Thank you. To use a cliche, horses for courses. Exactly. Uh, Harold, TV2 is, of course, a big football broadcast, uh, broadcaster, but you also cover chess. Now, those two sports couldn't really be more different. So how do the, how do the graphics differ and how do you use those graphics to aid the TV coverage? Yes, I'd like to use chess as an example where we use graphics and it's vital during play. So chess is major in Norway due to Magnus Carlsen's success and we have fairly high ratings and and we actually produce over 100 days of chess this year online and hopefully on premise tournaments. So it's chess is really driven by graphics as in a game of chess there can be minutes and minutes between every move. So the graphics is used to inform and educate the viewer on the current positions recommendation and such. Uh, and it's an interesting thing because we're learning so much using live transactional data with the chess for calculations. So it's used now a lot of for technical skills and experience for exploring how to use transactional live data to other sports. As of football, it's the graphics is not really vital during play. It's vital before the match, during the match in halftime anal analysis and such. But Football is where we gather the nation. This is where we put on the big show, the, the big AR solutions. And so we're trying now to learn from chess and transactional data analysis and put this into our football coverage as well. For instance, as Nikki said, heat map analysis live during the match. Does this first half where Erling Berg Holland plays for Norway, does this first half differ from his first half of the season playing for Dortmund. How can we use those such things for live analysis? And we hopefully we'll do that soon, if we dare. It's quite hard to get all these transactional data working, but that's a big difference. That's interesting. It'd be interesting to see how chess influences football coverage. So I should keep an eye on that. Uh, Pedro Sky obviously has a huge portfolio of rights, but um, how in your as you see it how do graphics and data how can they be used effectively to help tell the story of a match or a race an event or a tournament perhaps you can also give us an example sure um so presenting graphics for formula one is a different complete package of presenting maybe football or golf or so it's totally different stats it's a different way of communication so the game is totally different, but being cost effective and being efficient is having same workflows on, on let's say, on the production side, because for us, um, once we implement a technology, this technology, it can be used for all other games as well. Um, once we, for example, find a way of parsing, storing data and making that data available, then we can implement those changes as well for other productions. Makes a lot of sense. Let's uh, get to know your work a bit more, a bit better now, shall we? So what interesting or innovative graphics projects have you worked on over the last year and what sports uh, did you use them on? Let's go to Harold first. Yes, uh, using live transactional data, as I said, is a big focus for us. So one example is the ASO live rated data for the Tour de France. So our ambitions are to present live data for selected riders during the stages. Uh, so we aim to present analysis based on their individual data during a stage. So we want to, for instance, focus on where are our Norwegian riders, the stage favorites, the GC riders. And the ASO are now, are now providing live rider data for the Tour de France through a structure API. So every second now, there's velocity, position, etc., being harvested from a device under the seat of every rider's bike. Um, and we worked a lot during lot of 2020 to import this data. It's still a bit immature, the whole solution, uh, but we have great expectations for this edition of the Tour de France in taking advantage of this live data. So again, it's back to data. Yeah, a lot about data. And if anybody's interested in cycling, there's a whole uh, section on cycling and use of data later on in this show. Um, Pedro, do you have an example of a recent graphics project that stood out for you? Yes, we've been working on being data agnostic mainly. So we have a lot of uh, different data providers and different uh, sports that we process data, store data and distribute this data. We used to have different workflows. So having one unique workflow, one unique API 
to be more, much more efficient when consuming that data and making sure that workflow is uh, the same for all the productions. It's something we have been working on, uh, trying to be as fast and performant as possible for parsing and distributing this data, because sometimes there are new requirements that needs to be addressed very fast. This was a priority, and this allowed us to implement the AWS Bundesliga match facts last year, where we were showing the goal probability, for example, when there was a goal, uh, when there is a goal in the Bundesliga, we show the goal probability. This is processed by the AWS cloud, and then it's sent to us as a data feed, so we process it and we consume it um, as a graphic. Also, for example, the average positions, where we, when the game begins, we show the normal formation. And when the game is ongoing, 10 minutes after, you show actually the real position, the average position of the, of the players, the attacking zone. So there are many stats that we are showing live on the Bundesliga production. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, how about you, Nick? Anything interesting you've worked on recently? Um, so, well, like most broadcasters last year, um, we had to get creative with the restrictions of lockdown. So we saw some of our global production teams utilizing tools like vMix for more content creation. So for graphics, it was about aligning with these teams and ensuring we could still deliver branded graphics effectively. So we've begun to use Singular Live HTML graphics um, so for some events that have run through this workflow, uh, such as Liga MX and some of our boxing matches. So this is has really allowed us to react quickly to production needs and we've been able to have operators adding graphics from different countries when needed and it's actually been working really well that's really good we tried singular last year it is a it's, it's impressive especially in combination with vmix um let's look at some challenges shall we uh, especially with working with graphics for live sport these could be for either you as an individual or from a production point of view or from a technology perspective and uh, how you overcome those challenges. Um, Harold, let's start with you. What are the biggest challenges you face? Uh, from a technological perspective, as we continuously move from manual input of data use to automatic input from third parties, uh, a big challenge is data quality and data reliability. Uh, we aim to use live data for analysis and viewer engagement, but we need to present this according to our ambition and rely on minimal delay and complete and correct data sets. So for instance, this ASO live data are based on a device, as I said, under the rider's seat. And for, for instance, the simplest way of losing this signal if, it, if a rider is switching a bike. So the sim signal is used. And if this is one of the favorites and we're trying to use that data, it's just useless because we have no input data. So this is one of the Another example is our ice hockey solution, which is, also, as we said, based on um, Singular Live and vMix as well. We are dependent on volunteers on site. And if they punch in wrong data, these data go on their live on air graphics without any editorial. So we're moving the, we have the responsibility for what's the correct data, but we're moving the, the uh, production of the data and outsourcing it. And I believe that's that's going to be a lot of discussions coming forward as we do move to on third party delivery. Absolutely. Uh, Pedro, how about a similar question for you? What are your big challenges and perhaps what are the graphics problems that we still need to solve? Yeah, I think technology changes each time faster. And also the pandemic has accelerated a lot of those changes. Um, for example, remote working, I think like uh, not having access to studios, to VCRs, to PCRs, like these challenges where before was, was normal. Um, today, we are all mainly working from home. So we have to change a lot of, of the way that we work. Uh, but I think all of this gives us a big opportunity of you know remote production and cloud production. And I think the usage of, of a video IP has accelerated. So I think the, the the next challenges is on making it available, on security, for example, on making it scalable and, and making it reliable. So I think this is something that needs to be addressed and we are working on. 
Thank you very much. I'm going to stick with you, Pedro, if you don't mind, because I know you've done a lot of work with AR, and AR is going to be referenced quite a lot throughout this afternoon. I'm just wondering, what, from your point of view, what does AR allow you to do that perhaps you can't do with 2D or 3D, and where might AR take us? Yes. Um, as a broadcaster, I think we're using AR, in my case, for 15 years, more or less. Um, so we had used a lot of AR graphics on, on the story of broadcast graphics. And it always allow us to, let's say, show uh, content and storytelling on air without cutting to a full screen graphics, for example. Um, an example is just when you are making a PowerPoint presentation, if you're focused on the presentation or you're focused on the person that is talking, I think if you're uh, you are seeing the person that is talking, you are much focused and then, if you are using AR graphics to present more content, you know, it's enriching and eye-catching. Um, but I think it has grown a lot because now every phone has a capability for AR. So this has extended the usage because now everybody knows what is AR, can use it on their phones. And I think like the next uh, big challenge is we as uh, people from broadcast graphics or sports broadcast graphic is, okay, how can we use those AR graphics that we use on the stadium or on the studios? How can we make those graphics available for people in their house, for example? And I think um, game engines has accelerated also a lot on, on, on this kind of technologies, making it easier to use. So there's a lot of people using uh, game engines to create AR content, even not from broadcast, but from other usages. So VR and AR, I think it's a topic everywhere today. And and we as broadcasters, as I told you, we've been doing this for a long time. No, that's fair enough. Um, Harold, in your opinion, where and how should AR be used? And perhaps more interestingly or importantly, where shouldn't it be used? Yeah, we believe that AR must be used with caution. Uh, it, AR is a great, great tool for decor and storytelling, but it requires preparations and practices. And, and we create... We're trying to create a rigid setup for flexible use. Um, so when AR is used correctly, we create great variations and tempo in the storytelling. But if it's used incorrectly, it can be just disturbing eye candy. So uh, by principle, we try to create AR that looks like physical objects. We uh, if we had unlimited budget, we would have carpenters and uh, screens, but I represent that using AR. Um, and we can't use AR every day. We need to differentiate between the small events and the big events, our parties. So passive AR for the core is used often and create a sense of a larger studio or hide unwanted visual noise. In a way, we save the AR for the, the storytelling for the bigger events. So as AR is pushing us to, to uh, pushing the boundaries, we actively take steps back to make sure it gives us the intended value. Uh, and it's also a great way to present our sponsors and product placements. But we try to be, we try to be, uh, take a step back to make sure that it's used. Absolutely, right. used, used appropriately. I think that's a, a very good message. Um, if you have questions, by the way, for our panel, for Harold, for Pedro, or for Nikki, do put them in the Q and A tool or the chat, uh, and I'll ask them to our panel uh, shortly. Um, Nikki, can I come to you next? There's been a lot of talk in recent times about the cloud. You've you mentioned Singular already this afternoon and how it can be used to aid graphics workflows. Uh, it, what other ways does can the cloud be used for graphics? How does DAZN use the cloud? And perhaps what are the implications in terms of, say, efficiency, processing power, uh, or even staffing, for example? Um, graphics in the cloud allows us to simplify some of those workflows and open up that ability to share our resource um, and operate graphics from anywhere. And especially for design being such a global company, that's quite key. Um, as mentioned before, as we said, we're using HTML graphics on some of our live events. And we're starting to see where this can be extended to wider teams like social media and magazine shows to enhance their own, con their own content. Um, and that's allowing those graphics to be add, added with, within our brand um, safely. Um, it's allowing us to put the power back into the producer by creating interfaces that anybody can use with just a laptop. 
obviously it's not a one size fits all solution um and as you're saying of course there does need to be consideration around the process and power and where we're not quite ready to make that compromise um the zone isn't just an ott service we have post broadcasts and world feed productions with strict slas um so these are areas that right now we aren't ready to map those over to but as technology evolves use, utilizing both traditional and cloud i think puts us in a good place that we can continue to keep pushing this further and adapt and innovate as we see more solutions coming out there thank you very much that's very interesting let's um, stick with technology uh what new technologies have you seen or demoed or used that are you think are really innovative and or what would you like to use more of and why let's start with pedro sure um so i think it's a combination of of technologies for example we have a spider cam that we have on on our studio and this spider cam is uh, tracking and you can combine uh optical tracking and physical tracking. And then we were using uh, some VIS engines with uh, Libero, for example, the new uh, possibility to have AR Libero, where you can, on the, um, in the studio, have a live uh, game, for example, or a, or a goal analysis directly on our studio, where you're zooming into the into the 3D stadium, and then you can see footage of the real of the real game. I think that was really not innovative. If you combine it with with SpiderCam, for example, where you can fly all around and and really move the camera all around the studio, uh, we really, really, I think that was a really really innovative project. Yeah, it cert certainly sounds it. Uh, Nikki, how about you? What have you seen that's piqued your interest? Um, I mean, the innovation piece for us is, I think, continue to build on those remote toolkits. Um, what is out there that can offer us more access for all our teams globally? Um, innovations around remote virtual studios and augmented reality are things we've been looking at. And again, there's some really interesting solutions there. I think a lot of providers in the industry are going that way. Um, and what's key for us is how do we empower production teams to still feel connected and part of the action in these remote environments. Um, so things around cloud tools for vision mixing, talk back, um, just making sure that if you are taking that operator away from the stadium, they still feel connected to the game. Absolutely. Well, if you need advice on how not to light a green screen, I can give you uh, a lot on that. Harold, do you have anything you can share with us as far as innovation is concerned? Yeah, we do have a great relationship with our neighbors at MCB Bergen, the VisRT, and we're, we are looking forward to take full advantage of the new Vis engine. And um, as we, we also used the Libero, but mostly for football, but we're now trying to use the Libero for cycling analysis, for instance, both uh, sprints and breakaways. And um, We've had some great, uh, great success with our ice hockey production, as we just mentioned, using Singular Live and VMix. So the whole, and we've just purchased just basically anything of Norwegian sports, handball, football, basketball, volleyball. And we are gonna spend a lot of effort in implementing innovative solutions for distributing top type of Premier Norwegian Premier League down to seventh division to everyone. So using all these new technologies in providing, you can just what log in and watch your granddaughter play a handball match as cost effective. That will be a great, great challenge for us in the next couple of years. Again, I should look at I look out for that. Thank you very much. Um, we're coming to the end of our session. If anybody's got any questions for the guys, do please post them on Q and A or chat. Um, There'll be some people in the audience, I'm sure, with aspirations to join graphics departments or move into graphics or uh, work in sports graphics. I'm wondering if you guys have got any uh, suggestions for them. Um, Harold, come to you, perhaps. I know your background is actually in banking, which is quite interesting. So what would you say to someone from outside of television who wants to work in sports graphics? And what have you learned? Or what, can you, what have you brought with you from the banking sector? Yes, after 15 years in the banking industry, I'm now lucky to work close to my interest, sport. 
And I would say that banks are about five years ahead of broadcast in using internet technologies, automate, automating manual tasks, analyzing transactional data. And I believe the different industries like banking and broadcast are coming together technology wise. And developers, for instance, can move easily between the industries. And, uh, and also to any of you that have a dream of working in a bank, it's not too late to switch the <laughs> other way around. <laughs> I, I have to be honest with you, Howell. I can't see that being too many people's dreams. No. I don't. I don't want to burst your bubble. Um, Nicky, you moved into sports graphics from another part of uh, of television. Do you have any tips for anybody who wants to make a similar move? Uh, yeah. So I actually set up wanting to be an editor. So I was editing live highlights for the Sky Sports News media team. Um, and then one day we got a Clarity software, and nobody knew how to use it. Um, so I just put my hands up and said, that's fine, I'll learn it. And I think it, I just got the graphics book from there. Um, my tips would be to build up your contacts, ask to shadow on productions, um, understanding that live environment is really important and be willing to learn. Um, there's a lot of free training and demo software available and the industry is full of talented people who are willing to give you their time. Thank you very much. Pedro, do you have any advice for anybody who wants to work in sports graphics? Yeah, I have three three words. Learn to <laughs> code. Because I think like there is going to be every time more data. There is going to be every time more statistics, more tracking device. It, the amount of sports data that is being generating each time grows exponentially. And I think like understanding to code and analyze this data Sometimes just an array of numbers that you have to think, okay, this array, how can I convert it into a graphic that people will understand it in their houses? So I think that is a crucial part that people, you know, are into a sports graphic. You don't need to be a super programmer, but at least writing a few scripts will be good enough, let's say. Thank you very much. Excellent advice. We have a couple of questions from the audience, which is great. Um, this one, I think Harold might be well place to answer this how can graphics be used to enhance lower tier sports so maybe tier three sports for example in what ways can that be used maybe to help increase viewership or i guess production quality yeah i'd, I'd like to use the ice hockey solution as an example because in norway we're lucky to have uh, volunteers on ev basically every match in the lower divisions as well and they are now being given let's say just an ipad and when they punch in the starting lineups, it's uh, stored in a central database at the Norwegian um, Sports Federation. Let's just call it that. And those data are available through an open API. So when we use, when we develop, as Pedro say, an API using a data import, we can use, for instance, Singular Live and create triggers. So we have a structured data with a match, with a lineup and a score. So this is, um, and once we've done it for one sport and one division, it's just basically the same setup. It's just mass production in a, so we have all the parameters, structured data, bandwidth. That's what I said with banking five to 10 years ago, the bandwidth was not good enough for broadcast now it is so therefore basic banking is five years ahead of us absolutely thank you very much Does, uh nikki or pedro do you have a a point of view for that question as to how graphics can be used on lower tier sports um i think again where we've talked about opening those tools to those teams that maybe we don't have the resource readily available or again we a lot of the time we're moving so quickly, we don't have that development time for a lot of our productions to sure. put those new graphics in. Um, so I think that's a perfect scenario where actually we can use that to enhance all levels of production. Super. One more question I think we've got time for. So this is to Pedro and uh, David is asking, are you able to use AR in live match productions now i appreciate the bundesliga is produced by uh, a third uh, the federation but are you able to use ar in live matches at all yes yes we use ar 
graphics um, on, on Bundesliga matches. And we use also image uh, processing tracking. So this allow us to, to use AR graphics in, on different productions and different matches at the same time. So yeah, sure. Fabulous. Right, we're out of time, also out of questions. So um, there you have it. Um, only use AR where it's appropriate. Uh, consider processing power when using the cloud and learn to code. Uh, thank you to all our guests, uh, to Harold, Nikki, and to Pedro. I enjoyed that. I'm sure you did too. Woo!